My name is Brent Gary. I'm one of the geologists here, postdoc geologists here at the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies. And I'll be doing the Ask an Expert here today on uh, the lunar of Apollo and Constellation. Okay. Okay, so we're going to be kind of flipping between two things. One is the computer uh, screen over there, uh, which will have a lot of images and then eventually our one, a nice, beautiful artifact right behind me. But uh, I wanted to first start off with a few quotes from Jerry Seinfeld because I think he summarizes driving on the moon pretty well. Why don't we fly up to the moon and then drive around? That is the essence of male thinking right there. And then, what were they doing with a car on the moon? You're on the moon already. Isn't that far enough? Well, to go deal with that last part, no, it's not far enough because when you're landing on the moon, you want to land in a safe spot. But a lot of the interesting geology is not in the safe spots, so you need a way to get there. And so the first uh, Apollo 11... 12 and 14, they had to use the old two-foot turbo to get to all the places they had to go. But starting with uh, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, they wanted to up the ante a little, go a little farther, branch out, do some more uh, exciting geology. So they realized, hey, we need a vehicle to get on the moon. And that's when they even had the, that's when they started uh, uh, incorporating the uh, lunar rover into the J missions. Now there's some a lot of ideas about what the lunar rover wanted to, you know, could have looked like or was going to look like in the early days. They didn't really know what the soil was like on the moon. They had an idea, but they didn't know. So they didn't know if wheels would work, if you would need six wheels, if you would need giant farm tractor wheels, or even if you would have to burrow through things with these uh, Archimedean screw that they were testing out. So that's just like a little scale model going through flour or something. Then they wanted to do longer duration missions. They were even thinking about this, even in Apollo, of staying up there for two weeks in these pressurized lover, uh, rovers, so these um, lunar mobile geology labs, as they're called. But they were huge, they were cumbersome, and they didn't know how to really get them to follow one piece. But they did a lot of field testing with these giant pressurized rovers. But when they finally decided they are going to come to the moon, all smart engineers like they do, they take their kids' G.I. Joe model, and what do they do? They build, or G.I. Joe doll, and they build a model. So two of the engineers at General uh, Motors built a little scale model of what they felt the lunar rover was going to be like because they had to package it up and stick it in like a little trivial pursuit piece into one of the corners or sides of the lunar lander. And so this is kind of what sold Von Braun, and this is what we wound up with for the moon. So the lunar rover, it's got four wheels, all of them kind of, uh, front wheel steering and back wheel, they all kind of turn and uh, together. On the front, and the, there's like a gold spot um, on the front left. That's the camera. That was the video camera. That was actually controlled by somebody back in Mission Control in Houston. Oh, thank you. So you have a television camera, so that broadcasted uh, color TV back. You have the high gain antenna, uh, low gain antenna. The controller was right here. It was a T. It wasn't. It was like a T joystick. Um, it, did, it wasn't a steering wheel, so they had something different because you're in these giant pressurized suits. Um, they didn't really, you know, they can only really control it with the one hand. You have two seats that your grandparents would take to the beach, you know, kind of like these little fold-out seats. There really wasn't there much for support. But getting in and out, sitting down was very cumbersome for them. And on the back is where they had a lot of the tools and kept uh, a lot of the rock samples, and they also had store stuff underneath. So you had this rover. It was battery-powered. You have these mesh wheels, um, and kind of what it looked like. Oh, so when they were training, they had this 1G trainer with actually had rubber tires so that when they got to the moon, they actually had an idea of uh, what they were looking at. So inanimate objects are great, but seeing things in motion works out a little better. So this is uh, John Young. He is uh, the commander of Apollo 16, and this is what they call the Grand Prix. And so this is where uh, uh, Charlie Duke, ex the lunar module pilot, got off and with the video camera and started filming it. So here it is. You can see all the little craters that they're trying to dodge, craters of every size. There's the lunar module in the background. He's getting up to maybe like uh, 10 kilometers an hour. That was kind of the fastest they uh, could go, but their average speed was more about 6 or 7 kilometers an hour. And so while these rovers didn't really allow them to really move faster, what it did was it didn't 
um, it can help them conserve their consumables, so their oxygen, their water, um, as they are doing these longer traverses. So they're out there for seven, almost eight hours uh, on these EVAs, as they're called, and they did three, one a day for three days straight, and so they were pretty tired. So this helped them rest a little as they went from station to station. But you can see the dust picking up. I mean, it's just spewing all over the place. You know, it's skidding out. So uh, it's uh, pretty fascinating. But we're, the plan right now for NASA is to go to the moon back by uh, 2020. And so what they're doing is developing new lunar rovers. So this is called the, the Chariot. Um, this is the unpressurized rover configuration. As you can see now, there's a little difference here. One, you have more wheels. So you sort of have these six independent axles with two wheels on them apiece. Um, the astronauts are standing. They're not sitting. Okay, that makes You're only in one-sixth gravity, so it's pretty easy to hop up and hop down. Uh, these turrets actually rotate, and so you can kind of look around 360 degrees as the other person is driving. And you have a little joystick up here that is used for driving and touch screens. Um, they also want to do longer missions. So remember those uh, pressurized laboratories that I showed you earlier? Well, this is what they're designing now. So this is called the Lunar Electric Rover. If you saw the uh, inauguration parade, if you were on the right channel, you might have seen this right at the end. Um, but this is going to be a pressurized cabin where astronauts can actually live in there for up to two weeks is uh, what they're going to be testing out this year. So you have big windows sitting up here. It's like looking at an IMAX screen. It, the geology is just beautiful right from there. You have a camera up here that people can pan and tilt. And there's several cameras all over as well as lights on it. Here it is kind of compared to the Apollo lunar rover. So you have the Apollo rover at the top. And so the length of the Apollo rover is about the length of the cabin itself where the uh, astronauts will live. And on the back is where they're going to have their spacesuits because they don't need to be in the spacesuits at all time. The inside is going to be is very functional. Not only do you have seats, but those fold down and you have your bed and you can kind of lounge around, work on your computer at night when you're tired. Um, so it's a very functional living space. So you have to think of it, it's not only your work environment, but it's also your, your home. Uh, this is astronaut Mike Gernhardt in the cockpit. This is uh, during one of our testing days. Um, he's just kind of working on the uh, powering down the vehicle right there on the touch screen. Here's sort of the inside of it. Um, one, the first thing is where do you go to the bathroom? <laughs> it's a camping toilet. So buck 99 at your local uh, camping facility. Saves you millions of dollars. Uh, here it is looking from the back towards the front out the window. Uh, you have these uh, blue uh, fabric tarps at the top, and those fold down and give you your own individual sleeping quarters. So you have almost a built-in tent right there, and then you put them up during the day uh, when you're doing your work. And here's one of the long seats, and here's the hatch. That's how you get into the spacesuit. Now, the spacesuit, this is a new concept, is you get in through the back, okay? Instead of kind of zippering it on inside the lunar module like the Apollo astronauts did, and then dumping all your oxygen and air from the lunar module, what they do, uh, the concept for here is just to go inside the back and dump just a little bit of air in between the backpack and the hatch, and then you're ready to go. So the other person can stay inside while one person goes on the EVA. This is how you kind of climb into it. So this is me trying to figure out how to get my birthing hips through these little holes over here. Um, you open the hatch. Uh, you kind of stick your feet in. You know, you turn on the power, get your communication set up. There's a little chin-up bar that you kind of lower, help lower yourself down in, get your feet squudged in to the boots um, as best you can. Uh, move away your little helper box, and then there's handles on the outside. So these uh, blue and red handles, that helps you. The blue ones closes the door from the inside, and the red ones lock you, uh, unlock you. Uh, then you close, and you're ready to go. Uh, so you get your gloves set up, move your latches, and you step away, and you're ready to do some geology. NASA did a field test uh, last year out in Arizona. So this is just a three, four minute video. It kind of shows everything in action. This is the chassis. So this is the chariot chassis. Um, and it's modular so you can put the, the pressurized rover on top or, on the, or use it like this with the turrets. So here's two of the guys uh, testing it in the UPR mode or unpressurized rover mode. Uh, you know, they're probably going five, six kilometers an hour. It's still pretty bumpy out there. So the speed of it would, is pretty much the average of what they were pacing on the moon. You have your tool chest on the back. As you can see here, the turret is now moving while one guy is off there collecting some rocks. Uh, this is a touch screen with some buttons, a big emergency red button in the middle. Um, 
so that a thing can turn around on all axes, spin on a dime. Now here's the uh, small pressurized rover going up a hill, so we can go up some pretty big hills, get some nice basaltic uh, outcrops here of the lava flow, kind of going on top of the Moenkopi sandstone formation, silty sandstone. Um, so here they were doing a one-day test. Here's us driving down. So we can get up some pretty good slopes, which is good because we want to expand where we go um, in and out of craters, up, up the uh, different hills. You know, If we can get in and out of a rill, that would be great too on the moon. So we really got to test it out. Here it is going sideways. So if you find something you like, you want to see it, but you still got to go you know, somewhere else, you can crab as it's calling. So you, the wheels will all turn around and you can go uh, one way or the other. Here's one of the geologists looking through our observation bubble. Here they are stepping out. They did a pre-plan of their EVA. Now they're stepping out, getting off the uh, hatch. Uh, the, the, the rover actually raises and lowers, so you can you know, clear lots of big rocks and then lower down so you can, it's easier to step on. Uh, you have walking staffs because these uh, suits are cumbersome and your big geology hammers. So this allows an astronaut, instead of like Apollo, of sitting in the suit for six, seven, eight hours, they can go out, do a 35, 45 hour EVA, come back in, get out of the suit, rest a little, have lunch, go to the bathroom, kick their feet up, make their next plan, drive to their next site, and then when they get there, then they can hop back in the suit and get out again without having to wear the suit all day long. And I promise you, these are just mock-up suits, so these aren't pressurized, but it gets cumbersome <laughs> and <it> gets hot. <laughs> um, so here's the guys getting back on. Now that they've collected rocks that they needed. And so you kind of have to back in. There's no rear view mirror. So you kind of have to know where your feet need to be. And then you just kind of throw your back in to it and start climbing out. So here's the AR climbing out of that e after that EVA. It takes a little, uh, you kind of develop your own system. This is Rex Walheim. He's one of the uh, NASA astronauts. He's got a little more slender build. So he slipped in and out like butter. Where the other of us had more potato shaped bodies. And so... We kind of got caught a lot. <laughs> um, so here it is, traversing to one of the next stops. And so last year, they, they did two one-day trips. So two, two crew members did a one-day long traverse. And then one of the crews uh, did a three-day long traverse. And I was part of that crew. So I lived in this. Um, this, this is the part of the expert part. I'm one of the few people who have had an actual chance to drive it, and I also had a chance to live in this thing for three days. Um, and hopefully this year, one crew will live in it for 14 days. And so that's what they're pushing, because they want to do these sort of really long sorties. As you can see here, the ro uh, wheels were just kind of tilted as they're driving down the road. You have the mass camera extended, and that was viewed by the people back in Mitch Control in the science back room. Um, so this shows you really how maneuverable this vehicle is. You know, as you're going to go through the lunar environment, you know, the, the, the train there is so crazy that you really want a functional vehicle that can kind of give you a little bit of everything that you might want to do on the moon. And that's what they're currently doing now is throwing everything in there, seeing what we like, and then building upon that. So this is generation one. They're going to build generation two. This docking hatch over here allows it to dock, dock with a lunar base, with a, a robotic kind of service module, or with another small pressurized rover as needed. So it's a very functional, small um, vehicle, and hopefully it'll help extend our stay on the moon and extend the distances of where we get to go. So this is after a long day in the field. They're coming home at, you know, in the dark. Um, it gets dark on the moon, too, every once in a while. There's lots of shadows, so you definitely want lights. Um, over, that, over that test period, we did about 142 kilometers of driving with that thing. So... Um, so this is the team, okay, it's not done by one or two people, it's not done by the people in the cockpit, but this is all the people, the engineers, the suit people that it takes to uh, design a vehicle such as this, um, and so you have a lot of people who are working really hard to try to get us back to the moon. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, I'll take any uh, questions that you have. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.